We're going to be talking about um, pain in the context of central sensitivity syndromes, and I think this is going to fit nicely into the topics that have already been covered. Uh, no disclosures with regards to this work. Um, I'm, we're going to begin with a patient, and this is a real patient. Uh, the patient is a 56-year-old white male with a past medical history significant for a locally advanced head and neck cancer for which he received chemo radiation five years ago. He was referred to my clinic for a supportive care consultation due to significant symptomatology that his physicians were having difficulty managing. Those symptoms included the following. Generalized aches and pains, which started after therapy was completed. He was told it was all in his head because he didn't have any cancer. Fatigue. The patient, when uh, queried, indicated that he would wake up at 9 o'clock in the morning, sometimes 10. Limited activity, he'd take a shower, shuffle around the house, would take naps during the day, would go back to sleep 7 or 8 o'clock at night. He was not able to work and was disabled. He had severe anxiety and depression, with anxiety dominating. He had significant problems with cognition, most specifically short-term memory. He was always cold. He, came, he was sitting in the office in a hooded jacket, and he was freezing. He indicated that he had problems with sleep, and sleep was not refreshing. He had common problems with nausea and had significant difficulty maintaining his weight. He also had a high degree of distress. This patient had central sensitivity syndrome. And we see this all the time, and sometimes we don't recognize it. So what I would like to do is begin by talking about the recovery of, traject of, of uh, patients from their treatment, the trajectory of recovery from cancer therapy. And I'm going to use this slide, which actually does not come from the oncologic patient population, because we haven't studied this. This is from the ICU literature. And what you can see here is functionality on the y-axis, and this line represents decline in function, normal decline in function with age. Now, if you have a critical illness, your functionality will drop. For some people, they'll recover functionality, maybe not getting back to their baseline, but thereafter losing functionality as would be expected for age-matched comorbid-matched controls. Some patients have a critical illness, and it affects them in such a way that their functionality drops immediately and then declines at a more rapid pace than would be expected for age-matched comorbid-matched controls, which means as you get out in time, they are increasingly frail, increasingly having problems with function, and for some of these people that leads to early death. This is the frailty phenotype. We also know that patients who get hit with a critical illness recover, get hit again, recover, get hit again, recover, get hit again, may wind up in the same situation that over time their functional status years out from their um, uh, medical insults, that their functionality is dramatically decreased. We not only know that there's a decrement in function in patients who have critical illness, and this is an exemplar in the head and neck patient population, which is my population. We also know that critical illness, including cancer, can affect long-term survival. And we, of course, expect early on that the, when you compare the expected death rate in the population to death by cancer, um, that, uh, or we include death by cancer, we, we expect our patients to have a lower survival, right? They're dying of their cancer. But as time goes on, as years go on, the death rate from the cancer drops, and the patients are all cured of their disease. And yet what we observe is that these patients continue to die at a higher rate than age match comorbid match controls. And this is not just true in head and neck, this is in multiple cancers. 
So our, our patients who survive their cancers are somehow impaired physically and they are dying sooner. And this is a hot area of research. So what I think of when I think of survivorship is I think of survivorship as a state of increased risk. You are at increased risk of dying, not from necessarily your cancer, but the effects of your cancer and its treatment. You are at increased risk for early frailty and escalated loss of function. And you are also at risk for something I haven't talked about yet, which is symptom burden. And that symptom burden may be either local symptoms, local regional symptoms, depending on what the tumor was, or systemic. So what we're going to talk about today are systemic symptoms that patients with cancer and survivors experience. Now, let's begin by what causes systemic symptoms. Well, it is very clear that diseases evoke a stereotypic neurohumoral response, the purpose of which is to aid the body in recovery. And short term, those um, neurohumoral um, pathways are beneficial, but long term, it's maladaptive and harmful. When we talk about the study of systemic symptoms and uh, sickness behavior, one of the big problems is the taxonomy has evolved as our knowledge has evolved. So let me explain how I'm going to use this verbiage for the rest of this talk. Sickness behavior um, really originated, all of this work really originated in animal models, right? So you can't ask a mouse to fill out a questionnaire. So it was sickness behaviors instead of sickness um, uh, symptoms. And, and the sickness behaviors, hypersomnia, decreased activity, lethargy, um, altered uh, dietary intake. So you'll hear sickness behaviors. Um, there is also, uh, there in, in people, in humans, you'll hear the phraseology central sensitivity syndromes. Now, in the oncologic patient population, we have symptoms very similar to what is seen in central sensitivity syndromes, but we haven't actually classified it as such at this point in time. So what I'm going to be talking about are systemic symptoms. And what systemic symptoms comprise post-treatment sickness syndrome, which is the phraseology that I use in the, in the survivor population? Pain, fatigue neurocognitive changes, mood disorders, temperature dysregulation, gastrointestinal dysfunction, and metabolic disorders. You've already heard about some of these. Why are these important? Well, I think one of the things that we have to recognize is that these symptoms are, num number one, not just associated with cancer and its treatment, but exist in survivors. Um, they seldom occur in isolation, so these patients usually have complexes of symptoms, and that can be profoundly affecting. We've already talked about the fact that these symptoms are associated with adverse outcomes, including survival. And, um, and I think one of the most important things when you're talking about survivors is the patient question, which is, you know, I went through all of this. When am I going to get back to myself? So let's talk about mechanisms now. So systemic symptoms are common, they're important, what's causing them? And a lot of the research with regards to the causes of systemic symptoms centers around neurohumoral communication and neuroinflammation. So the brain and the body, when you are ill, have to communicate, right? You have to, the brain has to orchestrate. Um, and in order to do that, there has to be physiologic and behavioral coordination and usually in the systems that are involved are the endocrine system, you've heard a little bit about that, the immune system, and the central and peripheral nervous systems. Cytokines act as one of the key immune to CNS signaling molecules. And we know tumors produce cytokines, we know the host response to tumor um, it, uh, causes production of cytokines, we know that treatment, including radiation and chemotherapy, can result in the, uh, the production of cytokines. Well, how can peripheral cytokines cause a symptom? 
And the way that happens is the, the, the um, cytokines are able to transduce or create a change within the brain itself. And there are a variety of mechanisms. We're not going to go into those mechanisms. But what's important to recognize is peripheral inflammation causes changes in the brain. It causes a neuroinflammation. And when you get neuroinflammation, you get activation of microglial cells, you'll get activation of astrocytes, and that enhances the neuroinflammation because they then go on and produce central cytokines and central, uh, or central neurotoxins. The neuroinflammation then alters neural function and it alters neural pathways. And those changes can be profound and they can be permanent. This is, there. you can look up any number of dozens of, of uh, articles that are uh, depicting very similar pathways where surgery, radiation, chemo, and tumor cause along the afferent pathway um, uh, cytokines that affect astrocytes and microglial cells. And then you get this um, uh, 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 effect within the CNS um, with uh, damage to nerves and, the, and, and nerve uh, function and then the production of or the resultant sickness behaviors. This becomes really important because if the damage to the brain is permanent, um, you may, uh, you know, if you've had your insult already, and now the tumor is gone, the surgery is gone, the radiation is gone, the chemo is gone, and people look and they say, oh, you have fatigue, let's measure your, your um, cytokines, and the cytokines aren't elevated. But the thing is, the problem has already happened, right? The damage is already done. So you don't have to necessarily have ongoing inflammation. In order to manifest the symptoms of a prior insult that resulted in neuroinflammation. And that makes it very difficult for researchers because you have to catch the insult, right? It also makes it difficult with regards to strategies for treatment, right? Because if you're looking at an anti-inflammatory, you know, you have to catch the problem when it's ongoing, not after the damage is already done and is irre irreversible. So when we think about a neurobehavioral sickness model, you know, we've talked about this disease, treatment, psychological stress, and that's a whole talk in and of itself. Um, interact with the neuroendocrine system, in, uh, inflammation in the sleep-wake cycle, and that's a whole other talk. Um, causing domains of dysfunction. I've broken them down into mood, cognition, neurovegetative, and somatic for the purpose of this particular model. What we're going to be talking about predominantly is pain, but we'll talk about a few others as well. So let's move on to central pain. So we've talked about neuroinflammation um, and how important it is. How does that relate to pain? Well, let's talk about what inflammatory pain is not. Okay, what is it not? In the old literature, central pain was, thalam was related to thalamic strokes or CNS strokes. Okay, that is not what we mean. That's old terminology. That terminology is out the door. Now when we talk about inflammatory pain or central pain or central sensitization, depends on your taxonomy, we are talking about pain that's related to an, 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 uh, a process which we'll go into in a little bit more detail, but it links a number of inflammatory disease processes. So if you look, it is now recognized that fibromyalgia that chronic fatigue syndrome, that in irritable bowel syndrome, post-traumatic stress disorder, migraines, just keep on going, that all of these syndromes are linked by central sensitization and central sensitivity syndrome. Now let me just clarify one thing or just let you know right, that taxonomy is a real problem in this realm of research. The pain researchers talk about central sensitization and they're referring only to pain people who look at a broader array of symptoms, we'll call it central sensitization syndrome. And they're usually now talking about the whole gamut of symptoms that may be associated with these processes. 
So if you have never read Eunice, you should read Eunice. I think he's, it gives such a wonderfully coherent and cogent discussion of central sensitization and central sensitivity syndrome. And he talks about, he pulls together a lot of the current literature and talks about what are the things that result in central sensitivity, whether it's inflammation and infection, whether it's um, a physical uh, trauma, um, chronic poor sleep, genetic predisposition. Um, you can go through all of these. And I think one of the things to really recognize is psychological trauma in and of itself can cause central sensitivity. There's this, the, the literature is replete with the effects of uh, child abuse or molestation on long-term symptomatology, and it's very real. Um, all of these cause effects on what we've already talked about, the neuroendocrine immune system, which then cause, causes hyperexcitement of the central nervous system with central sensitization or inflammatory pain. So what is central or inflammatory pain? It is a disturbance in pain processing. It is a disturbance in pain processing. And there, it can affect one of two arms. You can get central augmentation or amplification of a stimulus, a painful stimulus. Or you can get attenuation of descending antinociceptive pathways. So as soon as you experience pain and, and, and pain is registered in the brain, you get activation of pathways that will dampen the sense of pain. Um, either one of those can be off, and generally both. So what winds up happening is a stimulus that should not elicit pain or should not elicit severe pain does. Again, think back. This can be permanent. Right? This is the result of damage to the nervous system, which is permanent. The other thing that's really critical to central or inflammatory pain is that it is not characterized by a recognized pain generator. So we all look for pain generators, right? Ah, you, have, you stubbed your toe, you hurt. We have a reason. In, in inflammatory pain, there isn't an obvious pain generator, and this creates a challenge for us. Um, this is, uh, if you're interested in a review, this is a really good review in um, Nature Reviews. It, very complex, but showing exactly what we're talking about, that a variety of insults, including cancer, can result in neuroinflammation by a, a number of pathways causing increased sensitivity and, or, uh, or augmentation with decreased um, uh, negative regulation and chronic pain. Complex. We're not going to go through all of that. How do you know central pain? When, what, what, what are the characteristics? When are you going to know that a patient comes in with central pain? The first thing is it's usually, it is usually diffuse and multifocal. Right. This is the patient who comes in and says, you say, where does it hurt? And they go, I hurt all over. Now, the first thing most people do is they ignore them and say, can't happen. It does. It is not in the distribution of known tissue damage. So there isn't an obvious pain generator causing the pain at that site. The key is it's associated with other systemic symptoms. And we'll go into that in more detail. And it responds to neuroactive compounds directed at neurotransmitters. You can have genetic predispositions. You can have environmental stressors that can, help, can trigger in and of themselves, much less exacerbate the problem. So what I tell people who are interested in being able to understand or diagnose this more easily is I send them to um, the fibromyalgia literature because they're way ahead of us, way ahead of us. And um, this is the um, American College of Rheumatology criteria for fibromyalgia. If you take a look at it, it has, I think it's 28 sites of potential pain. They ask patients to click off or circle the pain sites, and then they, then they ask them about systemic symptoms. So it's simple. It's widespread pain with association of other systemic symptoms. You don't actually have to have them fill this out. 
but if you ever want to take a look, do. All right, so we have a patient who comes in who's had chemo radiation. They really had bad mucositis. They are recovering now, but now they're saying, hey, look, I've got this really widespread pain and et cetera. How do we treat them? Well, the first thing is you really have to educate patients because one of the things they come in and they, is they say, I hurt all over. I don't understand why. What is going on? And they think something's really wrong. You know, the patient comes in and says, my cancer has to be back because I hurt, right? So the first thing you have to do is you have to educate them and, and let them understand what's going on and why we need to use different techniques in order to deal with their pain. And there's a really wonderful education guideline that you might want to look at. And they draw this, they have this really simple diagram, which I think is extremely helpful in educating patients about central pain. Because what it says is you, you have a stimulus and that stimulus goes into the back, back box of the brain, and the brain perceives the right amount of pain. But if you have central pain, that amount of stimulus goes into the black box, and the brain perceives it as much more pain than it actually is. And it can actually get to the point where no stimulus, or very minimal stimulus, goes into the black box of the brain, and the brain perceives very significant discomfort. And patients get this because they go, that's me. Now, there are a whole host of treatments, and, and this is actually a really good, it's in the American Journal of Nursing, a really good review uh, from just this year on treatment. I'm not going to go into a lot of treatment because I'm going to tell you the literature is not all that hot in the oncology patient population. We really have to, we have to borrow from or extrapolate from other um, disease processes. But what I want to do is I want to talk for a few minutes about the other symptoms that are found in this complex so that you can then put this together and recognize the patient who has um, uh, chronic sickness syndrome or uh, chronic uh, systemic sensitivity, whatever verbiage you want to use. Let's talk about neurobehavioral symptoms. So this is, a, this is an example of a study we did um, in our head and neck patient population at Dandy. And we, looked at, we did neuropsychiatric testing, uh, looked at self-report measures of cognition and delirium in 70 head and neck cancer patients and conducted a prospective study. The thing that struck us was that it's similar to other populations. For example, the breast cancer patient population, which is the population that's been most extensively studied, Patients walk in the door with neurocognitive deficits. Walk in the door, 47%. The thing that's most effective is short-term memory. And here we are, we take these patients, we give them an hour-long lecture on toxicity and how they're supposed to deal with um, the, the treatments that are ongoing and we expect them to remember, okay? Um, So they come in with neurocognitive deficits. What happens long term? This is, oops, this is a slide where zero is the demarcation, improved at three months, worsened at three months. So you can see for some patients after they complete their therapy, and these are various different uh, domains, some of the death, some, some patients do improve, but some don't. Some actually worsen. So important to recognize that some of these patients are going to have long-term deficits. And again, the most common is going to be memory. In the head and neck patient population, because of the aggressiveness of the therapy and because of the need for use of mind-altering agents such as opioids and benzodiazepines, um, we have a, a, and the effect of the treatment we have a very high rate of delirium. This was a, in this study, we um, queried patients once a week, querying them once a week, not capturing anything that happened in between those weekly visits. 9% of patients had syndromal delirium. That's huge. When we went back at the end of the study and we asked self-report, whether patients felt that gave them a definition of delirium and asked, did you feel that at any time during your treatment 
you had delirium, 30% of them said yes. Because patients can't necessarily remember, we went back and asked the caregivers. And we had the caregivers, so the caregivers felt that almost 50%, between 40 and 50% of patients exhibited delirium at some point in time during the course of their treatment. But we also asked them about neurobehavioral, uh, neurobehavioral problems. And we saw shocking quantities of neurobehavioral problems. Um, this, if you look at just nighttime behaviors by themselves, 83%. Um, agitation or aggression, 52%. Irritability or lability, 52%. I mean, these are profound numbers. And then when you looked at severity and distress, and, and caregivers are one of the areas that we're doing research right now, and you can see that the, and this is a scale of zero to five, you could see that there's a significant degree of distress that's associated with these symptoms for caregivers. They're the ones at home taking care of patients. Very important to recognize. How about anxiety and depression, mood disorders? So what we know in the, it, so this is in the head and neck patient population. We were looking at syndromal depression and anxiety, skid diagnosed DSM-4 category um, criteria. Where is, if, I don't know if John is here. Um, high degrees of, of depression associated with the cancer and cancer diagnosis, and again, again, dramatically increased rates of anxiety compared to the general population. And I think the thing that, that's most important about this is this is none ever mood disorder, and this is depression and anxiety since cancer. So these were people who did not have premorbid problems with, or precancer problems with anxiety or depression. And if you look how that impacted the, the, um, on uh, quality of life, this was the fact total, very profound decrements in quality of life comparing patients with or without anxiety and depression and those that did and in most of the domains. So mood disorders have, and anxiety in particular, has a, just a dramatic impact of quality of life. Chronic fatigue, we've talked about this to some degree already. Um, the, my, I, I'm a history buff, so I have to go back to history. Um, the concept of fatigue has been with us as long as physicians have been there, because as long as patients have been there and physicians have been there to ask them about their issues, fatigue is something that's been recognized. Um, in the 1980s, um, there was a very interesting literature um, about neurasthenia um, and characterizing neurasthenia. Um, kind of waned a little bit. And then in the 1950s, the concept of myalgic encephalomyelitis um, uh, rose up. and, and it, characterized as a fatigue with joint pain, and then that seemed to subside a little, and now that's coming back. In the 1990s, there was chronic fatigue syndrome, and, you know, early on, uh, many uh, physicians felt or were biased to feel that this was a psychological process because, oh, these were people who had anxiety and depression, therefore the fatigue, the, the fatigue couldn't be real. Okay, now we're, you know, 30 years later, we're sitting there going, ah, you know, this is a syndrome. No wonder they couple. Um, and they're all related to neuroinflammation, so they should be there together. Um, and now we recognize that we're talking about an organic process, not a purely psychological process. One of the big debates these days is, no, is, ta uh, is, is taxonomy. Again, what are you going to call these? And you, know, you can read different um, uh, uh, investigators and they'll use these phrases differently, but let me give you kind of a synthesized version of how I think of, of fatigue. There's peripheral fatigue, which is the fatigue you go run three miles, you're fatigued. It relates to decreased energy and muscle fatigue. You go to bed, you feel better, you hope. Um, central fatigue is different. Central fatigue um, Central processes that directly affect the thoughts and behaviors associated with the fatigue, including lack of motivation. So there are changes in the brain of people who have 
central fatigue due to neuroinflammation. You can look at the brain and it's different. It's, you see areas of atrophy, you can do imaging, functional imaging studies, and you can see the brain doesn't work the same. And I think um, Deb brought up a really good point about motivation. There is a motivation, there are areas of the brain that, are, that function for motivation, and those are, have been shown to be impacted functionally and anatomically in patients who have central fatigue. So, you know, we get judgmental with these people. Why don't you get up and move? It'll make you feel better. When, you know, the motivation center is, has been um, uh, uh, damaged. So, in addition to these concepts of a central fatigue caused by neuroinflammation, um, there are fatigue syndromes. Um, and what's really important is not all fatigue is the same. And I think the literature is coming around to this. You can't treat everybody with fatigue the same because it's not the same. So you can have somebody who has chronic fatigue because they get five hours of sleep a night and they're tired. But that's not an inflammatory pain process. And, and so where things are kind of going is trying to parse out the different types of fatigue and chronic fatigue syndrome and myalgic encephalo uh, uh, encephalomyelitis are thought to be inflammatory in nature. Now, there's some people who just want to combine that into one. So just FYI. There are others who will say, okay, I distinguish chronic fatigue syndrome from myalgic encephal uh, encephalomyelitis by the fact that my, in people who have myalgic encephalomyelitis, there's post-exertional malaise, which is a dominant symptom. So they use that as a way of distinguishing chronic fatigue syndrome from ME. Some people want to include post-exertional malaise in chronic fatigue syndrome. So there's a lot of argument there. And I don't, have, I don't have a dog in this race, but I just want you to know what the issues are that come up. What actually, to me, is the most fascinating part of this is now that we have the ability to look at large numbers of cytokines and kind of um, uh, parse out networks and, uh, and panels of how they're, they're um, elevated, one of the most, I think, fascinating studies that I've looked at is looked at trying to create subsets based on cytokine panels. And what they parsed out was two fatigue syndromes. Fatigue illness is what they called one, which was fatigue neurocognitive um, dysfunction and depression, which was one group. And then the other group had, and, and this was, these were parsed out by their cytokines, and then they looked at the symptoms. And the second group had fatigue pain, which was malaise and hyperalgesia. Don't know that this, is, this may be the direction in which we will, in the future, define fatigue. And then we can actually do clinical trials of drugs or therapies in groups that are like so that we actually are able to get consistent results. We know, uh, we already know that fatigue is associated with uh, inflammation, but I do want to just underscore that fatigue and probably many of these other symptoms we're talking about do have other mechanisms such as mitochondrial dysfunction and autonomic dysfunction and sleep disturbance. And sleep disturbance is really a biggie and alterations in circadian patterns and biologic clock mod modulation and et cetera. So don't think when we're talking about inflammation, we're talking about the be all and end all. It's just the thing we know the most about right now. I'm going to, I, I know um, hypogonadism has been a, a big topic today. I'm just going to talk about it for just a couple of, of, of seconds here. We know in the oncologic patient population, there's a, there's a high prevalence, um, higher in patients with cachexia. Um, we already have talked about the symptoms it's associated with. So we'll move on to when we're talking about pathogenesis, and I think this is where kind of hypogonadism links in with pain, um, is that, um, when we have two types of hypogonadism. We have primary or hypogonadal hypogonadism where you have elevated LH and FSH, but you have end organ damage or, or dysfunction. So in this case, um, uh, testicular dysfunction. So you have a, a low testosterone. And we normally think in the oncologic patient population that this is gonna be secondary to chemotherapy. 
although patients can come in hypogonadal, it can be diagnosed as hypogonadal. Um, one of the things that's really important to note, and you know, you can sit there and say chicken or the egg, but patients who are hypogonadal um, have a, a marked increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines. When we talk about secondary hypogonadism where it's, or, or central, where there's a low LH and FSH, causing the low T, um, I think one of the things to realize is that opioids can cause this. So if you have a patient with pain and you give them an opioid, their testosterone level is going to drop in a few hours. Um, so, and, and so let's talk about that a, a little bit more because we don't recognize that our patients who are on protracted or long-term opioids really do have profound effects on their endocrine system. Um, the mechanism of why opioids cause low testosterone levels is unclear. There is a hypothesis that there's um, a disruption of uh, the normal patterns of uh, secretion of um, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Um, the, and, and there's this very interesting interaction effect between pain and low testosterone in that you know, you exacerbate your pain in an inflammatory milieu and you're low on testosterone, you increase pro-inflammatory um, uh, cytokines. So low T can make the pain more um, prominent. So the question then becomes, well, what if you replace the uh, testosterone? Are you going to improve patients' pain? And the answer is we don't know. Let's talk about sleep disturbance next. Sleep disturbance um, is associated with a myriad of adverse outcomes. We know that, and, and sleep is becoming increasingly recognized as extremely important. In ours as a society where sleep is not uh, something that most people get enough of. Um, and, and there are a variety of different mechanisms, but what I want to um, harken back to is that in sleep disturbance, we know that there are an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines again, and one of the things that we can measure easily is C-reactive protein. And we know with patients who have sleep disturbance that, um, and by the way, elevated C-reactive protein is correlated with adverse cardiovascular events, hypertension, weight gain, diabetes, um, we know that if we treat sleep disturbance with um, therapies such as, and this is an example, cognitive behavioral therapy, we improve the sleep parameters and we decrease the C-reactive protein. And this is a study that shows this. Here's cognitive behavioral therapy, percentage of patients with high C-reactive protein over time, the patients who got uh, cognitive behavioral therapy to help with their sleep uh, demonstrated a decline in C-reactive protein. In the head and neck patient population, which is my population, we know that there's a marked increase in sleep disorders, and that's the case in many oncologic populations. Sleep is dramatically disturbed. Um, in the head and neck pop patient population, in addition to disturbances of sleep in general, we also know increased obstructive sleep apnea which is also associated with increased mark, uh, inflammatory mediators. You know, so we're heart, heart thinking back to this same theme, increased mediators, uh, uh, cytokines, which are going to exacerbate neuroinflammation, exacerbate systemic symptoms. Um, and inflammatory markers improve with CPAP. There's a really good reason to make your patient use his CPAP. Um, the, so you make your patients improve, uh, you know, use their CPAP and, you know, their fatigue gets better. And, and I really think it's under, rep, it's, it, we don't recognize how many of the oncologic patient population that actually have uh, obstructive sleep apnea and sleep disorders that when treated, you drop the, the, the pro-inflammatory cytokine levels down and you improve fatigue and general sense of well-being and their mood and it's so something to think about. Let's move on to a quick discussion of cachexia. We've already talked about the fact that the hallmark of the wasting syndromes in cancer um, is loss of muscle mass. It can be secondary to the cancer itself, or it can be secondary to 
treatment. And I think that's really important to know. Both radiation and chemotherapy can cause a cachectic syndrome because they can cause pro-inflammatory cytokines. We've already seen that, and this is the, this is the classic slide, I um, hate to show it to you again, but this is a patient with the same BMI, 40, 24, one who clearly has a good degree of muscle mass and another that clearly has sarcopenia. And I'm not into the debate on sarcopenia. Sarcopenia technically is supposed to be loss of muscle mass as you age, um, but the people who've been doing muscle mass research have kind of absconded with the term sarcopenia and there's this big fight. And I'm not into that fight. When I talk about sarcopenia, I usually talk about people who just have low muscle mass of whatever etiology. Um, but what we know is that um, uh, sarcopenia is associated with um, diminished outcomes with a myriad of outcomes, and we'll show you that in a second. Um, actually, I'm going to show you that now. Um, sarcopenia is associated with decreased quality of life, increased nosocomial infections, increased hospitalization, uh, decreased activities of daily living. Profoundly impactful. This is, and, and, and this is just a slide showing you the impact of sarcopenia in patients, and it, this is in the sarcopenic obese patient population, but you can see the non-sarcopenic patient population and the sarcopenic patient population. That is a profound difference in survival. And let's kind of skip that. So what does that have to do with our patient population in general? This is a study that we, complete, we published almost 10 years ago now, and it's in the head and neck cancer patient population, and it's a pre-post study looking at muscle mass loss. Um, and in pre-post, I mean the studies were done before they started chemo radiation, and then the, the, the one month post measurement was one month post chemo radiation. And what we demonstrated was a significant weight, weight loss even though these patients were followed by a nutritionist, and that the bulk of that was fat, uh, was uh, lean muscle. And so 60 to 80 percent of the body mass loss we saw in that seven-week period of time was lean, uh, was muscle, and that was associated with decreased functionality, um, increased performance testing time, so real functional impact. And we did show it was associated with increased pro-inflammatory cytokines, decreased anti-inflammatory cytokines, and markers of oxidative stress. Move on to a larger study. Now, this was using CT scans, and, and, and there, are, there are challenges or issues with using CT scans at L3 to measure muscle mass. That being said, it makes it easy to study sarcopenia or muscle mass loss in patients. This is a, a study that was uh, presented uh, last year at Astro, 175 head and neck patients um, undergoing primary or adjuvant radiation therapy. This is how they defined sarcopenia. Um, baseline, 37.1% had sarcopenia. After treatment, an additional 42.7% could be defined as sarcopenic which meant overall you had 80 plus percent of patients at the end of head and neck cancer therapy who were sarcopenic. And what they found was that um, development of sarcopenia was associated with decreased um, local regional control, decreased overall survival, and decreased disease specific survival. Um, so I'm going to um, end there and come back to our patient. Um, Mr. GB, we did routine screening, looking for potential reversible causes of fatigue. We ruled out hypothyroidism, anemia, hypogonadal, hypogonadism. We educated him and validated his symptoms and disease distress. And in follow-up, he said to us that was the most important thing we did was tell him he wasn't nuts. For the generalized aches and pains, we started him on Lyrica, which worked very well for him. For his fatigue, we did offer a trial of stimulants, and the reason why I tend to do this in the chronic patient population is there's more data in the chronic fatigue syndrome patient population, and I think these people who have chronic fatigue are more like the chronic fatigue syndrome patients than the post-treatment or on-treatment oncology patients who have non-inflammatory fatigue. Um, 
we encourage graded exercise. Um, and I'm a big believer in Fitbits. I tell all my patients they need to get a Fitbit. Um, uh, for the anxiety and depression, we started him on Lexapro. For the problems with short-term memory, we did offer him cognitive assessment, which he declined. He said, well, if they don't have anything that's going to fix it, I'm not going to go do that, which was fine. Um, the, the cold intolerance, and I didn't get a chance to go into this, is probably the symptom within the syndrome that's least well studied, um, but patients have really chronic problems with uh, temperature dysregulation. We educated him about environmental temperature control and let him knew, know what was, what was going on. For his sleep, we offered him cognitive behavioral therapy and a sleep aid. He took the sleep aid, no surprise. Um, and for his nausea, um, because a lot of these patients do have um, uh, uh, slow, slowing in their um, bowels, and we like to use pro the one available prokinetic, which is Reglan. We started him on 20 milligrams POQID. And the patient was better. He was not perfect but his quality of life was dramatically improved, understanding what was going on and trying to work as he could to manage his symptoms within the context of what we could do to help him, uh, recognizing that, you know, quite honestly, our ability to fix the damage at this point in time is minimal. So I'm going to end there.